Welcome to another Liquid Bullet Productions. Joining me today, all the way from Australia, dope dealer to hope dealer, Mr. Gary Wright. Go along, guys. Nice to meet you. How you doing Thank today? You, you right? Yeah, good, mate. Good. Yeah, good day. How you uh, been? So, all right? Yeah, very good, mate. So can we just start a little bit with, um, so obviously you was um, dealing drugs and you went into the prison system, um, sort of related into sort of gangs and stuff. Yep. So before we get into all that, can we just roll back a little bit to the beginning, sort of where you where it started for you, where you grew up, etc. Um, so I come from a good home, you know. That's the funny bit, you know. Um, lived a life of crime, you know. Chose a path as a career of a criminal. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool, which was a pretty shit career choice. But um, you know, I come from a pretty good home, you know. Um, mum was a nurse for forty years, you know, worked her ass off. She's a good person. You know, there was no drugs in the home, anything like that, no violence. Um, my dad was good. He, my dad was, you know, a great guy, footballer, um, you know, sportsman, you know, real wise man, uh, real charismatic, chas- 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 that's the word. Um, yeah. And uh, he ended up being robbed from his potential from alcohol. So dad um, hit the booze and that's where it goes sour. Not his fault, but um, so him... Being on the alcohol meant him and mum weren't together, which meant there wasn't two wages in the home. So mum had three boys, single mother, worked her ass off and had nothing to show for it. You know, And that's not her fault and that's not his fault. I mean, at the end of the day, alcohol is a government substance, you know, like you know, who are we to judge, you know? So I don't blame them at all. Um, it takes two people to raise a family. Uh, we only had one. And um, so, therefore, you know, 10 bucks, 20 bucks was ham sandwiches and petrol to get us to school. We were broke yeah. again. So that's where my story sort of starts. As soon as I stepped out the home um, as a little bugger, you know, and looked around and see what was going on, you don't know at that stage. But in my head, getting a job wasn't an option. Um, I'd seen mum break her back and we had nothing to show for it. So, therefore, you know, I looked up to the older kids in the area. I looked around and, you know, the guys in the gold chains and the nice cars and the Nikes, um, they seemed appealing. So I headed down that track and that's where it starts, you know. Um, I had a bit of a go-getter attitude. I was a type of kid if um, the way I explain it is, so you know, some kids, um, you know, they jump puddles and if they jump, if they slip up, they get their shoe wet, you know, they climb trees and, you know, maybe a branch snaps, you know. Um, you know, they jump their push bike or something like that. I, I did them like every other kid in the street, but it wasn't enough for me. You know, it wasn't that thrill wasn't enough. So, you know, as a little bug, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, I grab a rock and throw it through an abandoned house window, smash the window, and then I get that buzz I was looking for. You know, so I was looking for a bit, bit extra than the normal kid, if you want to say the normal kid. You know, maybe jump the puddle, get his shoe wet. That's enough. Uh, it wasn't shit for me. So um, that's how it leaves. You know, the way I was made up, I had a bit of a go-getter attitude. Um, we were broke at home only because dad got robbed from alcohol, robbed of his potential from alcohol. Therefore, I fucking um, started the, the life of a career criminal. I took the wrong career choice, didn't I? You know, not knowing that yeah. time that occupational hazard of being a career criminal is um, dead, washed up on drugs, or in prison for a very long time. Yeah. yeah. What, so, what sort of age, Gary, was the sort of, um, sort of, sort of game wrong for you? 
Um, shit, you know, before I was a teen, before I was 10 or 11, I'd been pinched for stealing, you know, fleecing cars, you know, um, being a little bugger in the area, playing up at primary school, you know, getting kicked out of school and stuff like that, punching on, you know, attacking teachers, stuff like that, just little brat stuff. Yeah. Um, I was a bit of, had a bit of a rebel attitude. And then, um, yeah, by the time I was in high school, so yeah, year seven, we call it over here. Uh, I think you start that about 12 years old. I already clocked up a few little charges, bergs and thefts and stuff. And you know, by the time I was in high school, you know, I left high school when I was 15. And by the time I left high school, you know, we started off fleecing cars and, you, you know, rob sheds in the back of the back of houses, you know, their sheds. And then robbed houses and then um, ended up moving on to shops, smashing grabs, you know, uh, roof jobs. So peel the roof back and shimmy down into the storeroom and, uh, where there wasn't yeah. sensors, clean the storeroom out, stuff like that. Um, you know, that was all before I finished school. Um, you know, I got caught for gun before I left school. I'd done juvie while I was still at, prim- at high school, sorry. Um, you know, I'd done juvie, got done for a bunch of shit, got done for a uh, pump-action shotgun. Um, I just had it stashed under one of the portables at school, thought I was pretty cool. Um, yeah, funny story is I actually – Fucking thought I knew what I was talking about, you know, thought I knew what I was doing, Um, you know, listening to rap rap music and watching fucking, you know, Scarface videos and all the rest of it. And I cleaned the gun up, so I cleaned it up with towel and wipe all my prints off it and then wrap it in sticky tape and, and stook it down the creek. Well, when the cops hit me up and said, fucking, we found out you got a gun and they went searching, they found it and that. They pulled me and my mum in the jack shop because I was only young. I was about 14, 15 pulled us in the jack shop and said, you know, we found your gun. And I've been a fucking, thought I was a tough little cunt. Had my mum there, make sure I was okay. <laughs> and, um, you know, because you got to have a, an adult with you, supervised. And I turned around, it's not my fucking gun. My prints aren't on it. I said, all right, and fair enough. And they called me back a while later, a few, a few weeks later, called me back in after they'd done forensics and that. And they said, no, nah, Gary, you're right, mate. You know, and my mum was gutted too, man, because I said to my mum, you know, it's not mine, mum. I promise you, no, mum, it's not mine. And she's, oh, no, my boy wouldn't be playing with guns. And, I said, actually, you know, Sandy, that's my mum's name. I said, Sandy, Gary, your prints aren't on the gun. I said, see, I fucking told you, mum. And they said, but they are on the sticky tape. Oh, fuck, man. <laughs> fucking rookie yeah. mistake, you know, cleaning the gun up and then wrapped it in sticky tape, The towel, wrapped around the towel in sticky tape and left me fucking fingerprints on the sticky tape. <laughs> Funny oh, yeah. story. Yeah, let's go just ask you there, Gary. So, um, obviously, that's quite young to have a gun, be carrying a gun. What are the gun yep. laws in Australia? All right. So at that stage, um, we had a we had a uh, it's called Port Arthur Massacre. So a guy called Martin Bryant, he went fucking uh, crazy in Tasmania, which is it's a little piece broken off the bottom of Australia, and um, it still is Australia, but um, it's just a little island off Australia. Um, he went crazy in an old heritage site and fucking um, shot a bunch of people. I think he shot over 30, 30, 30 or thirty three people killed. Um, Back then, we had open gun laws, so a semi-automatic rifle, you know, whatever it was, pump action, all that, you know. Um, you know so yeah, a lot of guns that you could just, you know, big clips on them, you know, 30-shot clips, and you just hit it once and then let it go as many times as you can, you know. Yeah. Um, that was open season then. I grew up I grew, grew up robbing houses and, um, you know, little 22 Rugers and that, so you just cock it once and butt, 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 as many times as you could, you know, um, be as big as a clip was. That was the case when I was growing up. And um, Martin Bryant, if I remember, happened in the late 90s, if I remember right. So the, it was called the Port Arthur Massacre. That happened in the late 90s. Um, when that happened, it changed our gun laws. So now um, everything's got to be – you've got to chamber it every time. So it's got to be cocked and let off a shot, cocked, let off a shot, cocked, let off a shot, however it is. Um, that's what our gun laws are. They're really strict. We have some of the – strictest gun laws and that was um because of the martin bryant port arthur massacre um i got pinched with my pump action before that um you know so therefore it fell i was underage you know it's just a fucking youth um it was unregistered firearm that's it you know that's all i got pinched with just an unregistered firearm there was no now if you got caught for pump action 12 gauge like i did back then uh, you'd be looking at a couple of years all day because of the laws yeah. but yeah so. Yeah. So uh, to continue there, mate, with your schooling and your sort of path you're going down. Yeah. There. And so, like, um, 
You know, I was into Bergen. We were into robbing shit. You know, I was robbing everything. You know, bored little cunts we were, fucking bored and just fucking out on the town and just fucking anything that was tied down, we'd fucking snatch it up. Um, we saw we thought we were pretty organised. Started fine tuning our shit to like where it got to the point where we were dropping into storerooms and cleaning them out and popping back out of there. You know, not setting off the alarms and that. You know, um, that was like the end of my Bergen days. You know, where I thought I was pretty organised. At the end of the day, man, the Jacks would always catch up with us. You know, we weren't, we were far from organized. We thought we were, but we were just kids. It wasn't hard to find us with a bunch of stolen goods, you know. You'd come to our parents' house and look down behind the shed or, you know, um, fucking catch us at a fucking empty house or some trap house, some party house we were hanging out at. You know, it wasn't far, it wasn't, wasn't hard to find us with a bunch of stolen goods, whether it was from a bottle shop, a bunch of fucking cigarettes from a milk bar, you know, whether it was some fucking push bikes from a push bike shop, whether it was fucking whatever it was, you know, clothes from a clothes shop, you know, we were kicking in the doors or jumping through the roof and taking shit, you know, we'd always get caught with something. And so before I left high school, I left high school year nine, I was about 15. So before I left high school, um, I caught a pinch, caught Caught a bunch of charges stacking up. Um, I think I went up about 40 different charges, Berg charges. I had to do some juvie time. Um, when that happened, I was I got to juvie and I thought, fuck, this is shit, you know. Um, this is not fun. Like, you know, always getting pinched. But it felt like every second Berg, they were on our table and catching up with us, you know, because they knew yeah. our ammo. They knew a bunch of little cunts who were just growing up in the area, running amok and fucking robbing shit and, yeah, I, I didn't think that was too cool. So in my head, I thought, fucking, you know, this is getting old. I can't do this forever. You know, like, this is fucking, they're catching up with us, you know. It, it wasn't a foolproof plan, far from. And um, so when I was in juvie, I thought, fuck this, you know, I'm going to level up. I'm going to I'm gonna change up and tune, as we would say. I was um, being conscious of my surroundings, you know. Um, you know, you learn on the run, leveling up, whatever you want to call it. But I thought I, I've got to, got to make do with what I've got and make sure I do better than the rest. That was my mentality. It really was. So I come out of juvie with the mentality of fuck bergs, fuck shot bergs, fuck, fuck, fucking robbing cunts. Now we're obviously ripping dope and shit out of people's backyards and all the rest of that shit, you know, um, sort of give it a rest. And I, I approached the older guys in the area and um, they were in the nice cars, gold chains and the Nikes and, you know, pushing the poison into the community, as we'd say, you know, there's always a, there's always a dirty substance running through communities. In our area, there was plenty of it, and um, I walked up to them on my pushy, or not walked, but rid up on my pushy, and pretty much said, you know, can you put me on? And they put me on. They give me work, and that's where it starts. And then I started making money, you know, obviously making more money for them, but making a bit for myself. So yeah, and then I moved into the drug curing business, if you want to say. Yeah. <laughs> what what type drugs was that, Gary? Um, so that time, weed, uh, ecstasy, um, speed back then, there was no such thing as ice. So we're going back, I'm 41, so um, you know, we're going back fucking 26, 27 years ago, 26 years ago. You know, there was no such thing as meth and ice and that. Uh, it was a bit of heroin, but that was sort of a bit of a taboo subject. We didn't bother with that. Um, it, was, it was a lot of party prescriptions, so a lot of speed, a lot of um, ecstasy. A lot of uh, acid, you know, a bit of coke, and um, some weed, plenty of weed too, you know. Yeah. Yeah, but I was using it too at that time, Lee. So um, at that time, I was playing up on it as well. We were going out to techno parties, warehouse parties. I was popping bickies and having lines and fucking shuffling to the techers. Thought I was a bit of a groover. And, um, yeah, like so I, at the end of the day, I was making other people some money. I was making a little bit of money for myself, but um, I hadn't leveled up properly I was just yeah. touching touching into the drug world you know just stepping into it just touching the surfaces and it was when I was about 18 Lee so I was about 18 and I decided to fucking stop taking drugs and that's when it got serious so because I am um, that was the business I, I was in was selling drugs let's not lie about it and um you know poisoning my community part of the problem I was but you don't realize all this till you're older um, I, I decided I've got to be better than the rest. You know, we were all, we were all fucking, you know, had a pocket full of drugs and, you know, gobbling them and fucking making a little bit of coin to get by. And I thought, I want to fucking, I want to, I want to fucking be a bit better than the rest. So I knocked it on the head at an early age. I was about 18 and I stopped taking everything. Um, knocked it all on the head. 
and just become straight. I took it like a job, you know. Um, I got up in the morning. I went to work. I, um, I pushed my poison, made my money, um, tried to keep my house clean. So meaning uh, I never had drugs left at home, never never left anything at home where I rested. Um, you know, I wouldn't drive around with stuff in my car. Do you know, like obviously have someone else hold it ready to run or, you know, meet someone at a spot. I was a lot, it was a lot of organising. You know, I got to a stage where it was a lot of organising, telling people, you know, delegating, telling people what to do, keeping my hands clean, you know. Um, that's where what ended up going on. Um, I got pretty damn successful. Not not I'm proud of I'm not proud of what I've done, but um it's my story and I'm I'm not gonna talk shit, you know, I'll tell it how it is. But um yeah, I, I was pretty successful, you know. By the age of my early twenties, I owned a hair salon, um, hundred thousand dollar car, thump and gold chain, you know, I'd go to the strippers, spend ten thousand dollars a night, you know, all that, you know. Um the usual, it's pretty standard, you know. A lot of kids come out of the area and do this, you know, they do. Um it's what I'm doing now that makes a difference, you know. It's it's the guy I've turned into now, um, pushing hope, not dope. Uh, yeah, like you know, helping the community. You know, um, I really think that's that's pretty cool. That's pretty gangster, you know. But we'll get there, right? Eh? Yeah. Sort of turns your life around now. Sort of transition to the sort of better people and guide guide the younger ones into better paths. That's isn't right. it? Yeah. yeah so right. what was it, what was it like when your first prison sentence, Gary? How was that? Okay. Taken? So um. First prison sentence, I was uh, I was about 25, I think, when I got sentenced. So I caught a case. Um, I was, you know, I still hadn't fine-tuned my skills to the best of my ability. Um, you know, I thought I was pretty good at what I did, but there's always room for improvement. There was, there was some holes in my racket. Um, I was um, selling, supplying a, um, a bouncer from the next town over, actually a couple of towns, two towns over. Um, so they were a bouncer on the door of a club. And I was loading them up and they were fucking flooding the club. And I had a bunch of other things going on, but that was one of my fucking avenues. Well, they ended up, um, you know, selling to some undercovers. And um, there was two chicks that come up to him and met him in the club and they were sucking lollipops and chewing on chewy gum. And they were all, like they were part of the scene, but um, they actually undercover cops. And um, they approached him and he started doing business with them. Uh, I think over a seven-week period. He sold them uh, 1,100 grams of speed, which is like just over a kilo, and 7,000 uh, green Mitsubishis, which were ecstasy tablets. So, um, yeah, and they so, nailed me as his supplier. Yeah, nailed me as his supplier. It's not building a case on you then. They're sort of, uh... Yeah, yeah, it was. It was an operation. Um, yeah, it was an operation. They had phone intercepts, um, surveillance, undercover operatives, all that, you know, the yeah. usual usual get down when they find something they're interested in. You know, and like occupational hazard, I thought I was pretty smart. You know, I thought I, what I was doing was pretty good. But occupational hazard will say, you know, a footballer will always do an injury. A fucking drug dealer is always going to take a pinch. It's just part of the yeah. fucking part of the road, you know. Um, so, yeah, I fucking um, went up against the courts and I there was a fucking couple. I, I was pretty good at not talking on the phone or talking in cars or talking in houses and stuff like that. It was pretty fucking. I thought I had it down pat, but there was a couple of phone calls where he'd rang me and said, "Oi, I've ran out. I need you to fucking sort me out." So I'd send something his way. They'd hear that phone call, then they'd you know they'd watch him collect that, then they'd he'd pass that on to these two undercovers. They'd put yeah. it in the safe, pay for it, all the rest of it. So I was fucked, you know. I was always going to be pinched on that, you know. I was there was. Probably wouldn't have been a fucking jury in the land would have found me not guilty. So I fucking put my hand up and said, um, you know, I'll, I'll plead guilty. Um, I was given a five with a three. So uh, five years with a minimum of three years. So two years parole. Yeah, and that was my first, that was in mid 20s, early 20s, yeah, about 24, 25, I would have been. And um, yeah, yeah how, how, how did you. Um... How did you feel when the, the judge handed out that sentence to you? What sort of went through your mind at that stage? To be honest, Lee, I don't want to talk tough, but at that time I was almost conscious that this was, this was you know, five or three, it was a decent chunk. It was almost like a challenge, you know. I was in the streets. We were carrying guns. We were pushing drugs. We were making mad money. We had the gold chains. We were, we were part of a gang, you know, like, you know, fucking... 
we thought I thought it was all you know like exactly like you see the older guys do you know you listen to the music you watch the movies you know you watch the movies listen to the music watch the older guys that's what I thought was you know cool when I got handed jail you know, that same attitude I was saying about throwing a rock through the window you know like I'd go get a type of attitude so I was going to give it a crack you know I'm, I'm probably lucky I didn't get my head cut off you know if I come across the wrong guy but yeah. I went in there all guns blazing. You know, I, I thought, fuck it, you know, like, it is what it is, you know. Um, I have to have a dip here. Like I said, it was occupational hazard. It was always going to happen. Um, it wasn't 100 years. It wasn't 10, 20. It was only fucking three if I behaved myself, which was like, it was acceptable. And then you get in there, you don't know what to expect. I hadn't done jail for a few years. I only, you know, I hadn't done, well, I hadn't done adults, but last time I'd done jail, it was, it was kids' jail. You know, I'd rub shoulders to a bunch of people that had done jail. I went to jail and thought, fuck, we'll see how this goes. And I started getting girls to bring me in stuff and all the rest of it. And, um, you know, started that same mentality that well, it's all I knew, you know, like if I've got a product and people want it, you know, I've got power, you know. And um, so I started doing them ones. Got a few guys on side that were older heads and bigger heads in the, in the yard and made sure I was looking after them and then they'd watch my back, you know, that usual fucking – that usual system and it was all right, you know. Um it was it should have been a bit harder to be honest. Um I've gotten a few punch ons, you know, a few fights, you know, a few stabbings and stuff like that. And you know, I managed to slither through the cracks, you know. Um and I can remember, you know what, I can remember being about halfway through my sentence, I'm not gonna lie, and thinking, is this fucking prison? Like are you serious? Is this is this what they got to offer? You know, I thought fucking, you know, I would have been challenged in a big way by now. I hadn't. You know, I'll go all right. I'm no, I'm not a fucking, I'm not a fucking ninja by by all means. But I, 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 I back myself. I put my hands up when the time's right, and um, I'd done all right. You know, I'd been able to move and shake, hustle in the fucking yard. I'd been able to fucking crack heads. I hanged out with the good guys and that, and I thought, fucking, you know, this is all right. Then I got, I end up getting tipped. So you, once you play up, you get fucked out of, fucked off from a jail. Move yeah, on, you've got to go for another one. So that ended up happening, and I ended up getting into a, a, a our max, what we call our maximum security, notorious prison. You know, it's most notorious prison. Our maximum security. There's a few maximums, but this one's the the rigid digit. Uh, it houses some of the most notorious criminals in Australia. You know, you're talking bank robbers, murderers, cop killers, you know, serial killers, just, you know, hitmen. You name it. You know, big drug importers, all the rest of it. Yeah. You know, the cream of the crop when it comes to the criminal world. When I found myself there, I, I actually took a step back and, and took a deep breath and had a look around and realised I was actually, you know, I wasn't a big fish in a small pond. I was a small fish in a big pond, you know. I actually, it was a good slap in the face. It was a wake-up call because there was guys there that had just fucking, you know, they fucking eat me up. You know, they would fucking, yeah, chew me up and spit me up, literally. And um, But I also found at that same time, I also found I wasn't, I was far, far from the, the softest, weakest, unknown cunt in the yard, you know. Um, I actually knew what I was talking about. So, yeah. you know, if you want to look at it like, like as apprenticeship, it was like an apprenticeship and, you know, I, 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 I done pretty well. I was able to walk the yard with, you know, the notorious ones, the, the main heads, and I could um, hold a conversation, a criminal conversation with them and know what I was talking about, you know. Um, like I said, I was 25 coming to prison. I had my own hair salon. You know, $100,000 cars, you know, had stacks, you know, thump and jewellery, had a crew that was willing to put in work for me, um, you know, dropping 10 stacks at the strippers every night, you know, all the rest of it, you know what I mean? So I was able to – I didn't come in there fucking, you know, robbing grannies, you know, and so I was like – I found myself in a position where I, fuck, you know, I'm not a bad crook here. I'm, I'm a pretty decent criminal, you know. Like I said, I was, um, wasn't the best in the yard. I'm not going to never – not lie about it. I wasn't the top dog, but um, definitely far from the worst either. Yeah. So um, that sort of, on the criminal perspective, I sort of found myself as a crook. You know, I found myself, I fell into a pecking order and was almost quite happy where I felt. Do you know what I mean? I was like, I was, uh, yeah, uh, I, I could once, I thought I was good at what I did. Um, I thought I was a good crook. I thought I was all about it. It wasn't until I got to Barwon, and that's that's that maximum security prison we talk about. It wasn't until I got to Barwon and, and sat down and had a good look around and got to know people that I thought, well, fucking, you, you actually are. You actually, you know, you, you, you've been doing this over 10 years now, you know, and you, you've made good money doing it. You know what you're talking about. Um, there's always someone bigger and better. 
but I was quite happy where I fell in the pecking order. So that wasn't that wasn't good for my ego. Um, you know, maybe I deserved to be fucking chewed up and spat out. Maybe I wouldn't have got back out in the streets and started it all again, you know. Um, you know, I don't know if I deserved it, but you know, maybe I hadn't had my wake up call yet. Let's say that, Lee. I hadn't I hadn't had my wake up call yet, you know? Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you find mixing with the sort of uh higher higher sort of uh, higher end prisoners? Because a lot of people say that they actually learn more from them in the sort of criminal world, don't they? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely met some connects, um, you know, you know, got to know, like, you know, got to know guys that were on a fucking serious level, you know, real serious, you know, they were, they were willing to be really, really bad and, um, you know, reap the rewards, you know, they were cashed up because they were the baddest from their area or baddest at what they did. You know, like you think about bank robbers or hitmen or stuff like that, drug importers, you know, like those guys, you know, um, you know, they, they make a lot of money, you know, and but they're taking a high risk, high reward, isn't it? You know, um yeah. and so meeting them, you know, um, yeah, you, I'd be crazy to say I didn't learn a thing or two. Of course I did, you know. Um, probably didn't realise I was learning as much. But now I look back and you know, getting when once I got out and got back to the streets and started talking to people and meeting people and you know, going, hey, you know, what's going on? probably knew a thing or two because I'd just done three years prison and um, done it with some notorious cunts and, and learn a thing too from, learn a thing or two from them. Yeah, 100%. Gary, I'm just going to step in here. Um, mm -hmm. I saw a video online of, yep. of yourself and uh, you're basically keeping red back spiders in your prison cell. Is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, everybody loves the red back spider story. Um, but they're, they're, oh, they, so, uh, they're, they're pretty poisonous spiders, aren't they? Can't they kill you? Yeah, 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 yeah. They are. They're very, very poisonous. Huh? And, and so yeah, they're them, probably <laughs> top five. I'd say top five, maybe, Bloody of hell. Australian most 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 venomous spiders in Australia. As you know, Australia's got some notorious snakes and spiders and stuff like that. We've got some yeah. pretty venomous motherfuckers, some some evil critters. But um, I've always, like I said, man, I'm that, that kid. That, like, I was a real boy's boy, you know. Like I love crocodiles and fucking snakes and spiders, and I love all that shit, you know. Um, yeah, what can I say, man? I know fucking a lot, a lot of people understand it, but I don't know. There's something I just, you know, spiders never bothered me, Lee. You know, they never bother me. You know, they're they're all right. Um, they're only they're only dangerous if they bite you. You know, so you know, ever as a kid growing up, I've always caught snakes. Um, always like you know, play with spiders, like let them crawl on me and that. Because like, if you see a venomous spider and you fucking scare it, obviously it'll get on its back end and want to nail you and that. But if you just relax, give it five minutes, let it chill, just let it crawl. It'll crawl over you. You know, it's a good party trick. You know, holding a fucking venomous spider on your hand that's crawling over you and that. So it's a, um, a, a bit of a 50-50 chance there, though, mate. Isn't it? It yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's good buzz, but it's good buzz. Um, so. Yeah, anyway, so like I've always been known to play with them sort of things in jail. I had a white tail. I had a white tail that was 11 and 0. Um, so I used to fight it and bet on pouches and used to fight it against other spiders. And, um, yeah, that was 11 and 0. It actually died, got beaten by a pre man. It was missing one leg and everything. Um, it was a cool spider, man. Uh, <laughs> won me a lot of pouches, but ended up getting beaten by a pre man. So I was shattered. But, um, yeah, I've had snakes and, and spiders. So the redback um, – I had got a female redback and a male redback, and the female's got a big red stripe. She's black, you know, ugly looking bitch, and she's got a big red stripe. The males don't have a red stripe; they're just all black. And I found them, and I put them in a little container, and I was fucking sticks and like leaves and stuff in there, and I used to watch them and make webs and stuff. And then um, she ended up, so she's got a massive thump and back on her. And then one day I woke up in the morning, and her back shrunk. Like she's just fucking half the size, and like she's like she fucking done a heap of cardio in the night. <laughs> And I was like, what the fuck's going on here? And um, I looked in the corner and there was an egg. Yeah, it was a fucking, one of their fucking spider eggs. And then, um, yeah, it just so happens like a few weeks later, man, this egg cracked and because the male was in there, he fertilized her or the egg, however it works. And yeah, fucking uh, this egg ended up cracking and I had baby redbacks. I was stoked. I was so happy. It probably took me a few months to work it out, but I got it happening and I, when the egg cracked, all these little baby redbacks multiplied, you know, they, there was heaps of them. I had heaps of them in the tank and I was quite happy with this. I was actually quite proud. Well, at the time I lived with um, three other blokes. So we jumped through a bunch of hoops through the system, behaved ourselves for a little bit to get the, reap the rewards. 
And um, we lived in a little self-contained unit, four of us, and, um, you know, where we shared a, a laundry and a bathroom and, you know, we had our cells and they locked the door on the joint and that was that. And I come home one night and I walk in the door and the three lads are sitting there like that, and filthy. And um, I thought, fuck, what the fuck have I done wrong? You know, what's the matter, guys? I abide by the rules. I follow the politics. What the fuck's the matter here? And they said, guys, we've got to have a sit down. We've had a family meeting. We need to have a chat to you. I said, all right, let's have a chat. And they said, you know, we've dealt with your fucking snakes and your spiders and your lizards and all that shit. You've always got creatures and fucking little fucking ecosystems you build and that. They said, but those baby redbacks, we're fucking over them. They said, they cracked that egg crack last night. They said, that's the whack. We've done. We've had a sit down. They're going. And I said, well, fuck off, cunts. He's not fucking with me spider family. <laughs> and um, they said, yeah, we are. They said, there's three of us and there's only one of you. And I said, what? And they said, well, and I'll go, all right, you know, but there wasn't one. They were going, three of them would have bounced me head off the fucking floor. So um, they ended we had a, again, a bit of an argument. And they said, mate, the spiders have got to go or else we're not. And I said, fucking, just don't worry. And they reckon they're going to crawl out the air holes and that because I made little air holes in the tank. They reckon the yeah. babies are going to crawl out the air holes and, Mate, the joint turned into arachnophobia seven. Like they fucking every cunt was scared shitless. You know, these guys, they they weren't they are hardened criminals, but they weren't happy about these little spiders I created. And um, they said to me, It's either, you know, it's, it's you or the spiders, what's going down here? So I end up flushing the fucking things. You know, I end up having to flush them down the toilet, um, or else I would have had to punch on and I was gonna get got by the three of them. So I fucking, you know, I bowed down and fucking flushed the fucking spiders because they weren't happy about them. I wasn't fucking happy. I felt like stabbing them. I really did, but I just let it slide. I thought, fuck it, you know, it is what it is. But I was dirty. I was. I didn't speak to any cunt for about a week straight. Fuck you, cunts, <laughs> make me flush my spiders. But, yeah, they, they weren't happy. It's understandable, I suppose. You know, not everybody's a spider lover. but um, Mate, I, yeah. I ate spiders and we don't even have poisonous ones over here. So I can see where they're coming from. <laughs> Gary, you said about you also had lizards and snakes in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> I got caught for brown snake. So I got caught for brown snake. Um, so brown snake is very venomous snake in Australia, you know, probably top three venomous snakes in Australia. Uh, found it. Someone actually called me out. They said, oh, you fucking have a good we found in the garden. It was a baby brown probably about this big, real thick. You've been eating well. And fucking so I latched up, got it by the back of the head, got in a container and that, and fucking it was grass, man. I used to feed him frogs. And he used to, I let him out onto the floor and he'd be striking just because he was so young. He got like, usually, like, you know, it's like, um, imagine throwing a punch. I mean, you're a martial artist, you know, you know, you wait for that punch when, when you can, like, you let it, let it go when you know you've got it. Well, he was, he was that young. He wasn't like that. He was just throwing cut lunches just every time, he just, ah, you know. It he, he wasn't like he was leaning back and he'd wait for his shot and just bang. He, uh, nah, nah. He just, the second he said a shadow, he'd strike fucking 10 times. It was grouse. He was fucking so cool. And um, we used to let him roll around the floor and he'd fucking be attacking everything and fucking stand back. And the boys would go, you're fucking crazy. I used to get him by the back of the head and hold him and that. And he was fucking grouse. But what ended up happening is the screws come in to see me. And they fucking said, oh, Gary, fucking cell search. And usual. You know, nothing, you know. And I, I hadn't had a chance to move me Tupperware. Nothing unusual. I hadn't had a chance to move me Tupperware container. But, and they said to me, anything in your, your cell you want to declare? And I thought, fuck. You know, usually I wouldn't dry snitch myself. You know, usually I'd say, boss, whatever you find in there, it's not fucking mine. But um, yeah. <laughs> I thought if these cunts open the lid, these officers open the lid and get nailed by this snake, I am in the fucking shit, you know. Like they end up dead, you know, probably. And, um, yeah, I'll be in a bit of fucking trouble. So I've said to the officers, yeah, I've got a pet under the bed. They said, oh, yeah, what sort of pet you got there, Gary? I said, I've got me pet brown snake. They said, oh, fucking course you have. So I fucking said, I have, and I've pulled it out, and they've had a look at the pillow. Oh, they, wow, what the fuck is that? The thing's striking, little buggers striking at him. <laughs> and um, yeah, so anyway, they made a big deal of it. They made a real big deal of it. It's a native animal, so you can't um, you can't you can't capture a native an, an animal. It's actually a federal charge. So oh, really? um, from there, they fucking carried right on. They hit the news, radio, like you can Google it. Um, Victoria, Victorian prison prisoner caught with brown snake, like it's, it's on the, the net. <laughs> Yeah, it was all it was a big deal, but they sort of let me slither through the cracks. Reason being is because I declared it, and I said to them, like in defence, I turned around and said, "Well, fuck, you know, like if I had to let you find it, you could have got bitten." But the only reason I told you is it was there because I didn't want you to get bitten and they'll get fucked. Yeah, and they said, "Oh, yeah, true, you know, you, you declared it, you know." And um, the governor come down and see me, 
He said to me, Gary, I've been working here 20 years and I've never, ever found a fucking prisoner with a snake. What's the matter with you? And where we were down, we were down a little cottage area. So it's called sea rating. You know, you jump through a bunch of hoops and behave yourself to get the perks. You know, it's, it's a good rot down there. And um, you, get some, you get some easy going things going on down there, phones and fucking, you know, plenty of packages and stuff like that. You just got to behave yourself. And um, where we were down there, a lot of lifers end up down there. So blokes that have done 15, 20, 25 years. And they get, there's a program that uh, is like they give them a fish or a little bird or if they're lucky, a cat. And what goes on is they, uh, you know, helps them rehabilitate, rehabilitate, you know, and gives them, uh, you know, something to be responsible about before they let it back out into the community and stuff. Yeah. Reintegrate them back into society, you know, but and they use animals or pets to help them along the way. Well, I told the governor, I said, well, I'm just running my own pro- program, boss, you know. I said, oh, you fucking, you got birds and fucking fish and fucking cats and that down there. I wanted a fucking snake, so I found a steak. He just laughed. He said, <laughs> yeah. well, what would have happened if that snake would have bit you? Would that have I was fucking dead. Him? I was fucking, it would have been, you probably got about half an hour, an hour tops, not even. Yeah, you're fucking dead. You're brown bread. That snake had a nail job. But like I say, spiders, I've never been bitten by a snake, never been bitten by a smine. I've been wrangling them all my life. You know, um, yeah, I love them. And, like, you know, I've managed never to be bitten. They're only fucking dangerous if they bite you. you know, if you don't get bitten, they're not dangerous, you know? Yeah. You're, like, you're like Steve Irwin, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so let's jump back into your story then, Gal. So where, where we was there with the uh, going through the prison system. Yeah. So I ended up coming home, um, finished my sentence um, for the drugs, uh, come home. And got straight back into it. Um, you know, as you say, you know, as we say, uh, I finished my apprenticeship. You know, my apprenticeship was done then. Um, yeah, I'd rub shoulders with the best of them. I'd done my time. I did it like a man. I come home and, you know, fuck, <laughs> just got straight back into it. Um, at that time, you know, I um, I thought I, you know, I got out. I've been about twenty eight. And I got out and thought I knew exactly what I was doing then, you know. Um, got straight back into it, uh, you know. Got a so there's a, a got a little crew going. So there was um, like I said, man, product of the environment. I'm just a product of the streets. Um, you know, I approached the older kids. They were looking like they were doing all right. I was a younger kid on a push bike. It was just that fucking, you know, that same scenario. I was the older guy now. I was doing all right. You know, the younger kids. We had a chat and, you know, there was always kids coming up in the area. So from my area, there's um, west, south, east, central, stuff like that. And, um, you know, from each corner of the town, I plucked a, if you want to say, one of the fucking real ones. Um, fuck, man, it is what it is, isn't it? You know, like, the, so 100 kids will come out of a fucking school and there's one of those kids that are going to ride or die to the bitter end, you know. They're going to go right on with it. Um I approached one of those kids from each group and had, um, you know, corners from each area covered. Um, we started a crew. It was called LCG, uh, Lowest Cunts Going. So it was just about going lower than the next crew. Uh, the rules were that we wouldn't step out of our area and, and poach someone else's area because um, I did that and um, that's how I got pinched because I was fucking around in someone else's area. Those two undercovers wouldn't have got close to us at all if that was in my area um but because it was someone else's area i don't know i'll pass it on to him i don't know what he's doing so i got pinched learned from that mistake so i said we don't step out of our area and we don't let no one step into our area so that's what it was you know um we held shit down and uh i said nothing i'm proud of but you know it was part of the problem um we pushed poison on a decent level um i can honestly say at that time there was no one else's gear in the streets but ours we made, we made sure we fucking – we had it locked down. Um, you know, if the kids needed a gold chain or they needed a car or they needed a new toy or anything like that, you know, it was all there. They had what they wanted and um, they pushed that poison and, yeah, I kicked back and thought I was a don, you know. Um, yeah. Pretty shit, really, because, um, you know, how many families were ruined from it, you know. But it is what it is, you know. Everybody's got a story and this is my story, you know. Like I say, it's nothing I'm proud of, Lee, but it is what it is. You know, um, what can I say, man? And then, so the ironic bit is, what come next was, um, there's a bunch of gang act- gang act- gang activity that was going on in the area. Um, you know, other gangs stepping up, thinking they were capable of something, and all the rest of it. 
Um, there was a young bloke that, um, you know, we were pretty cool with. He ended up dying in a house fire. So um, the house fire was deemed suspicious. Um, I was never never charged, but obviously um, with the gang activity gang activity in the area, I was um, suspect number one. So then a bunch of people that you know thought they were about that life that realised they weren't um, started you know cooperating with the police and you know there's always two sides of the story and the truth somewhere in the middle, and they start telling. You know, uh, a, if you ask me, a bullshit side to the story. And um, I ended up getting alleged to a bunch of kidnappings. So um, four kidnappings. Uh, one was a double. So five victims, four kidnappings. Um, you know, alleged they were in a boot, a uh, pistol to the head, you know, um, tortured, you know, taken from spot to spot, all the rest of it. Um, that's what was alleged. I went up against the courts and um, faced anywhere from 15 to 25 years if I was found guilty. Uh, at that time, when I sat in the courts and heard them numbers, uh, it rocked me, you know, it knocked me for a six. Like me and my boys, we were always, we, no one cooperated on my team. Um, we stuck by that street code. Um, but I was sitting in, a, in the dock with a bit of taste in my mouth because, um, you know, I would have got out when I was 60 if I was found guilty, you know. Um, it was fucking, time, it? No, yeah, no amount of um, money, you know, guns, cars, jewellery. You know, women, you know, fake respect, it's only fear. Um, and go on and on, all that materialistic shit, all that all that fake shit in the streets that, you know, you know, young kids like myself at that time look up to and think it's really fucking cool. Um, it's not worth it, you know. It wasn't worth it. And when I was looking down the barrel at um a big sentence, I weighed it up and you could have given me fucking a hundred million dollars and it wouldn't have been worth doing the rest of my life in prison. You know, um, I thought, fuck, this is shit. At that time, Lee, I didn't know what the outcome was going to be. Um, I fucking um, was went went on bail. I got I got I got bail. I was remanded. I ended up getting bail. And on bail, um, it was the first time I stepped away from a life of crime. I thought, you know, we got heat up the ass. I'm fighting these big cases. You know, I haven't got room to move. Um, one of my mates on the inside, he was he hadn't got bail. A few of us got out because we, I was I had five coeys. So there was five of us, a group of us, a gang of us. And, um, you know, some got out, some didn't. One had parole breach. Another one got, you know, um, perverting the course of justice, tampering with a witness and stuff like that. So they got their bail pulled and a few of us got through the breaks and got out and stuff like that. And I was outside and I thought, fucking, you know, I'm going to give it a rest. I was going to just ease off. I've got to fight these trials. And, you know, I know plenty of people that were found guilty for being innocent, you know. Um, that's the ironic bit, you know. I was innocent for, you know, um, a lot of this, you know. Um, and it's funny, you know, like I've, I, I probably should have been pinched for a lot of things, Lee. I should have been probably probably found guilty for a lot of things I wasn't. But when I went up against the courts, you know, the world works in a funny way. When I went up against the courts and was sat there in front of the judge and um, looking, for some, looking at big numbers for something I didn't do, um, you know, it was a funny feeling, but like I said, the universe works in weird ways. And so I had a mate that was inside at the time and he was reaching out to me going, what are you doing, man? Let's get this shit going on. You know, like kick it off again, you know, make it happen. And I'm like, man, I haven't got room. Like there's nothing we can do out here. The heat's on. Like I haven't felt heat like this before. Just relax. Just let, just let it fucking take its, take its course. And obviously then, you know, I, I was, I was the head of my crew and we, you know, anybody that took a backward step, you know, it was a bit suspect. So I created that mentality. I understand it completely. But when, you know, I got, if I put someone in the car for a mission and they're in the back seat, we're going for a mission. And, and I says to them, you know, you good? And they're, oh, bro, I don't know about jail. Oh, fucking hell. That's, that's a red flag. Get the fuck out of the car. You know, and so I had, I, at the first time, I, I'd taken a backward step and said to the boys, hey, I don't know, man. You know, and then I had fucking my, my fellas that were coming up underneath me going, hey, what the fuck's going on with Boss here? You know, like he's looking a bit weird. You know, he's fucking acting a bit. How are you going? And I get it. I totally get that. But having the boys doubt you and then, you know, like, you know, I, I'd set that foundation. I get it. But having the boys doubt yeah, that hurt. Then facing big figures. And at that time, I didn't know if I was going to get off or not. So anyway, one of the boys inside was he was a bit younger and he was still had that gung ho mentality. He didn't want to fucking lay down and die. And um he ended up getting out. He lasted three weeks. He got caught for kilo smack in his roof. 
um, was his, actually parole officers. He, he felt his parole officer fell in love with him, and um, he she got pinched at her joint. Well, he he got pinched, you know, at her house with um, a kilo of smack heroin in the roof, and um, so straight back in. He lasted three weeks. You know, I, I lasted two and a half years on the outside, and um, we ended up fighting, going to trials. So we played out. So I'm at two and a half years we're fighting these trials. And um, he's gone back. He lasted three weeks. Come out with that balls to the wall mentality. Lasted three weeks, went back in. Now he's fucked. He's he got all this shit going on, plus another kilo of smack, you know, fucking all this. And then his girl saying to him, fucking, I love you, but, you know, you fucked me business. You fucked me job up. I'm, I'm your parole officer. I fell in love with you. And now I'm fucking I'm getting the sack and all that. And so we go to court, Lee, and um, we're about to film. The day before, um, We'd been acquitted. The next day we had the front and um, see how, you know, the paperwork would go and sign off and say, well, this court case just procedures, you know. So, but we knew it was a win on one case. And his lawyer, my mate's lawyer that was still inside, got caught for the kilo, comes up and says, um, did you hear what happened to your mate? I said, nah. He said he killed himself last night in the cell. Oh, fuck. Yeah. You know, one of my closest friends, you know. And, um, he didn't get a chance to get out, you know. He um he tapped out. It was it. He was over it. You know, his girl was breaking his balls. He was thinking he wasn't going to get away for it all. Um, little did he know that we end up beating all the cases. You know, um, we we got another chance to walk the streets again. Um, oh, I mean, yeah. So, so when that happened, you know, it out, he would have been maybe got away a bit. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Lee. But he didn't hell out. You know, uh, it's just part of life. I've lost so many along the way. Um, I suppose to be honest, there's probably at that time he had so much going on in his head and pressure. It's probably yeah. didn't see him any other way out at that time, did he? Yeah, that's correct. Hundred percent, man. That's exactly what it is. And you know, like, and then I, you know, once I got out, we I beat the case. I actually got caught on a little case. So um, there was one, one. I had another case on the side that was just a violence case. It was um, we went to a house and there was cameras there, and um, some people got hurt. Um, you know, the, we were looking for someone. His dad ended up coming out the front. And his dad got his head bounced off the concrete and fucking, yeah, it was all on camera. And ended up getting, I was always going to get pinched for that. You know, um, my head was plain as day. My four coies that were with me, they all got off. They all had hoodies on. So they all beat it. Um, I was the only one that went down. So it was the ironic bit was in the end, you know, the only person out of five of us, out of probably 100 charges in the fucking 100 years, the only person that ended up getting jail, uh, I had to take a plea because my head was on camera, there wasn't a jury in the land was going to find me not guilty, was me. So, you know, the boys doubting me, going, fuck, and what's he taking a backward step for? You know, I ended up, you know, it ended up coming, well, fuck, man, I'm the only kind that did jail here, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. obviously I'm good. A few others fucking end up getting out and getting on the drugs, you know, and another one killed himself, like I said. It was just all went to shit. So I owed a couple of years. I actually owned, I only had to do, because it was a violence, just a punch on, Um, I had to do, I've got eight months remand time. So I've got 33 months on top. I've got eight months remand time and 12 months on the bottom. So uh, it's 33 months with 12 months on the bottom. So take the eight months off, leaves me with 25 months, but I can be out in a year. I yeah. said parole denied. Once I got in, I said parole denied at prisoner's request. So I chose to do solid 25, you know, 25 months. I didn't want to get out after 12 and deal with the bullshit. When I hit the yard then, Lee, um, I knew – I remember I was in the dock and they said, you know, this you got got a couple of years to do. And my mum was crying, you know, you know, her son's going to jail again. She was shattered. And um, I said, We're good, mum, relax. We're fine. I was fucking happy as. You know, I was really, I was really good with it because I'd realized that I'm not gonna lose my life to prison, you know. I had a couple of years, that was fine. I said to my mum, we're good. I had the chance to walk the streets again. I lost a mate here, another one to drugs, you know, fuck it all going on. It was just a fucking – what goes up must come down. It all come crashing down. But um, when I got those couple of years, I was like, fine, let's do it. You know, I'll do the solid 25 months. I'm out. And um, I hit the yard then, and the boys were like, what's going on, Gaza? You know, and I was known to be a, a pretty damn active in the streets and, you know, pretty active in jail too. So they expected me to run the ball up and, do me thing. And I fuck, said, I'm Bali's man. I'm retired. I said, fuck off. I said, I'm telling you, I'm done. I said, I'm fucking, mate, I'll be stupid to come. I just got a fucking another shot at life. And while I'm going to come back into jail or get back on the streets and fucking take a risk again, I'm fucking over it, man. So I'm doing me time and I'm fucking going home, you know? And um, 
so yeah, I had a different mentality. Yeah, Gary, how, like how did different. you find that? So that. when 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 you'd yeah, made that sort of, like that. Um, when you'd made that change in your mind, how was prison yep. then? Though, because obviously before you sort of if you got into trouble in there, you didn't sort of give a shit. But but now you want to stay clean or stay out of the trouble. Was that yep. a harder prison sentence to yep. go through trying to stay out of the trouble? Yeah, it was, Lee. It was, um, you know, at any given day, a drama could lob off the bus. And, you know, I, I'm not going to lie, that, that whole sentence I was carrying, like I had a piece on me, you know, a, a shiv or whatever you want to call it, a knife, homemade shiv, um, you know, always ready for, for trouble. It was a, it was like an identity crisis. I knew I wanted to get out the life, but I was still stuck in the trenches, you know. Um, I wasn't moving and shaking in the yard. Um, I wasn't rubbing shoulders with the biggest and baddest criminals. I couldn't give a fuck if they were worth a million dollars or they had the biggest, baddest connect. You know, I didn't care. I, I wanted to do my time and go home. You know, um, I was over it. I'd learned my lesson, you know. I, I hadn't – I looked off – I didn't know I was going to get away with it, you know. I didn't know I was going to be found not guilty. Like I said, heaps of people innocent have been pinched. I know heaps of guys in jail that have been stitched up. And um, a lot of corrupt police involved, and that's another story. But so, like, you know, it was it was – it was a good feeling knowing that I had another shot at life, but I wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't all over yet. I had to get through the prison, you know, and now I'm not crewed up. I'm not cashed up. You know, I'm not, I ain't got, I'm not looking for the next turn. I haven't got a bunch of boys, you know, fucking hanging out with me. I'm just doing my own time. But um, I suppose, you know, I, I, I'll be, I'm not gonna, I won't, I won't lie about it. You know, sometimes it was fucking scary. You know, like at any given day, a drama could lob off the bus from another crew we'd war with. And I ain't got boys to back me now. I could have been in a unit with 10 of my mates fucking jumping all over cunts' heads. And now I'm that guy that rocks their one out and they've got 10 mates, you know. Um, yeah. It was very scary, you know. But um, I got through the breaks. You know, it, it was scary, but I think fear defines a man, you know. And um, I didn't buckle. I did all main, you know. Um, I didn't fucking hit the button. I didn't jump ship. You know, I stood me ground. And, um, you know, I got into, got into some fights, that, that sentence. Got into some fights, won some, lost some. You do that, you know. But um, nothing that didn't didn't crush me, nothing that didn't break me. You know, I was all good. Um, got to come home. Yeah, got to come home and got through the prison sentence. And you know, um, you know I'm mid thirties now. I was at this stage. I'm mid thirties. I come home and with the mentality, I'm over the life. Well, that's when it gets real fucking hard because um, I had a lot of fucking band aid, a lot of a lot of wounds to band aid. I had a lot of band aids to cover them wounds. Um. You know, I lived in such a fast lane, such a high risk, high reward, adrenaline paced lifestyle. Um, I was a known head in the area and everybody wanted to know me. Now I'd stepped away from a life of crime, which I thought was a good idea, which it 100% was. But it wasn't as easy as just stepping away from a life of crime and here we are today doing the right thing. No, fuck no, it wasn't that easy. Um, like I said, I had a lot of issues, probably some PTSD, you know. Um, Depression kicked in like a mad cunt. That's what happened. You know, um, I thought I could just fucking step away from a life of crime and, and step into a, you know, nine to five lifestyle, if you want to say that. I uh, found a straight girl and um, it wasn't that easy, man. Fucking, um, I ended up finding drugs. Like I said, I hadn't been on drugs since I was a fucking teenager and I ended up finding drugs, you know. Um, the way I explain it is um, like a footballer that, you know, is kicking the winning goals and he's captain of the team and, He's fucking everybody wants to know him and then he retires and he sits on the couch and he's trying to tell everybody, you know, fucking, oh, I used to kick them go, yeah, of course you did, buddy. Fucking next match is on. You're not you're not in, you're not in the next match. We ain't got time for you. You know, it was one of them ones, Lee. You know, yeah. I felt really washed up. I felt no one wanted to know me. I didn't have a hundred boys around me. Do you know I didn't have the fucking finest girls? You know, I didn't have the flashiest car in the street. You know, there was none of that. I was just a fucking, I was just another fucking. Another bare bum in the street, fucking just normal, normal, normal dude in the street. You know, I was nobody, just watering the lawn. And um, it, I thought I could handle it, but fuck, mate, did I come crashing down? Um, I got on a bunch of drugs, ended up getting a habit. It's funny, isn't it? You know, like I was that that head in the area that supplied the the product, and now I become a slave to that product. Like I said, I had no boys, I had no money. You know, um, I had I just had a repu an old reputation, just a name in the wind. Um, you know. No one give a fuck about that. I wasn't. I wasn't active. So um, I ended up finding drugs, and I fell off hard. You know, um, become really depressed. Um, tried to take my own life. Um, ended up ringing the police on myself. I'd had enough. Um, rang the police, 
and said to him, fucking, um, you know, this is my name. I'm an SVO, which is a serious violent offender. Um, I'm an SV, SVO. This is my address. This is my name. Come sort it out. Uh, the Soggies rocked up. So the SOGs, you know, Special Operations Group, you know, the masks and machine guns and all that, they rocked up and we had a siege, had a standoff and <clears> – <throat> I had the plans in my head to run out and get shot by the Jacks. You know, I thought I, I was going to end it like that. You know, I couldn't, I tried to hang myself and the, the rope snapped and um, I thought I got real angry and you know, it's a long story, but you know, it's hard to talk about, but it is what it is. And so I had plans on running out the police and getting shot by the police. You know, I thought that's, that, that I can end it like this. I, you know, that, that, that's a good, in my head at that stage, I fucking was all confused and thought that'd be a good way to end it. So um, they ended up talking me out of it. Thank fuck they did actually because I – anyway, so they arrested me. I threw me down on the concrete and um, I was handcuffed. And the funny thing, this is when I knew something wasn't right, Lee. I was face down on the concrete handcuffed and I was at peace. You know, I'd had such a stressful morning that morning. I was so filthy on the world and I was ready to fucking – to lose it all. And the second I was handcuffed and face down the concrete, I was at peace. I felt like every bit of weight had lifted off my shoulders. And what it was was that structure – you know, I felt comfortable to go back to prison, you know. Um, I felt comfortable to be restrained and know that I was going back to a, you know, cell. And yeah. fuck, is what it is. So um, funny thing is a copper that it, I broke his balls for over 20 years, detective, and um, he sort of pushed, you know, they, they, they clear the house and arrest me and chuck me on the ground and they stand me up and he sort of, you know, pulled me to the side and said, so fucking Gary, um, I've known you for a long time. He goes, you're not yourself. So then, and I was expecting a punch in the mouth, you know, that's what I'm used to by these guys. And um, he goes, I'm not going to send you to jail today. And when the enemy speaks the truth to you, it hits hard, you know. You know, when the enemy speaks the truth, it's a, it's a weird feeling. And um, he said to me, I've seen some things in my time. He goes, obviously, you've seen some things in your time. He goes, I've spoke to someone. I take a pill in the morning. He goes, how about you go speak to someone? He goes, I know yourself. He goes, I've known you for a long time. He goes, you're not yourself. He goes, I can see it in your eyes. You're not who you usually are. He goes, you're a bit scrambled at the moment, mate. He goes, how about I send you to hospital? I thought, he said, take his handcuffs, put him in the front, loosen him up, give him a cigarette. I'm tripping. Anyway, get in the back of the ambulance. I've got a couple of, you know, just uniform, first year sort of fucking rookies in the back of the ambulance with me. And I said, oi, what what do you have lined up for me? And they said, oh, you're in the shit. They said, no one was allowed to talk to you apart from the special operations group. They were the ones that had to communicate with you and they said any the line of defenses we had for you was they were sending the dogs in if you got past the the canines then they were going to send non-lethal rounds which is the beanbag rounds they said so you had to get through the the canines then you would have to get through the beanbag rounds and then they would have fucking hit you with lethals so then they would have shot me dead so my plans of running out the front and fucking going on with it i would have fucking i wouldn't have held them back you know it wouldn't have worked yeah, out well at all would have got yeah. first by the dogs yeah. 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 So um, I think I've been bitten by the spiders and the snakes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, so anyway, I went to hospital and went and spoke to some psychs and stuff, and then I sort of realised what was going on. You know, um, yeah, I sort of worked out that that fast pace, fast lifestyle, you know, high high risk, high reward, adrenaline, really adrenaline paced. Um, you know, a lot of popularity, a lot of look at me, look at me, show off mentality. Um. You know, it'll come crashing down. And um, so then I, I wish I had got out then. I wish I had got out from speaking to doctors after a few months and and um, went on the right track again. Then I hit drugs again, man. And then um, I lost my girlfriend in that siege. So I had a girlfriend, a straight girl. And she'd had enough of it, you know. That was too much for her. You know, she's a good girl, but is what it is. And then I just, then I really fucking hit the drugs, man. I become a raging junkie, Lee. I, um, you know, had nothing but the clothes on my back. Um, and every dollar I got in my pocket was just going on the next fucking next taste. I was smoking heroin, smoking ice, squirting juice, G, we call it JHB. Yeah, it was fucking crazy, man. Um, I died three times on drugs, had three attempts on my life, had people, because obviously you know, other crews are coming up and they're like, fuck, man, neighborhood trophy here. But, you know, he's not running for any crews. He's not tooled up. He's not cashed up. Let's get him. So I'm getting attacked from all angles. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, it was fucking crazy, man. But um, I ended up getting through it. I ended up fucking um, surviving, you know. Um, you know, died three times on drugs. That was a wake up call. You know, put my family through hell. But um, karma's a bitch, you know. So 
like I say, who am I to just step away from a life of reaping the rewards from being a drug dealer in the area and then, you know, step into a straight nine to five life? No, it doesn't work like that. You know, I probably deserve to feel the pain of being a fucking user, you know, being a drug addict. Yeah. And that's uh, made me who I am today. It showed you a little bit of um, sort of where you were supplying it. It sort of showed you a little bit of what the other people were going through, didn't it? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Fucking over did. Um, you know, I want to, my, my end goal, and it's not far around the corner. I was actually on the phone for a, a two hour phone call today, and it's looking closer than I thought. Um, my end goal is a rehab center. And, you know, if I hadn't have been become a raging drug addict in the end of my career criminal lifestyle, um, you know, maybe I wouldn't want to get a rehab center. But I, I feel, you know, um, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of drugs on, on any means, you know. Um, I, I don't agree with the government and the police. Not a fan of them at all, but I'm also not a fan of the drug dealers that are bringing in the fucking drugs and pumping it out and ruining communities. It's not cool, you know. And then you've got victims on the streets that are slaves to the drugs. And you know what happens then? You know, mum's strung out on dope, dad's in jail, kids are missing out on feeds, not getting Christmas presents, not going away on holiday when they should. What happens when those kids grow up? You know, their kids are probably going to go through the same. You know what I mean? So um, yeah. I really want to open up a rehab center and uh, break the cycle a little bit. If we can get some asses clean, get them back out in the community. Maybe they pay their mortgage and, and pay their taxes and go get a trade and their kids are eating breakfast, lunch and tea and they've got Christmas presents and going away on holiday and, and Christmas. Maybe when they grow up, their kids' kids are going to get the same. So that's my giving back. You know, I really say it. You know, I used to be a dope dealer. Now I'm a hope dealer. I push a positive message. Um, I'm still ganged out in the head. I'm still street street mentality. I'm still like all that same shit. You hear the way I walk and talk. But um, I've learned to not hate. I love now. Do you know? I've learned to, I've learned to love. You know, it was a hard journey, but I've learned to do that. My, my heart was blackened from greed. You know, I was just a product of my environment. I was dirty on a dollar. Um, you know, it made me a very nasty person, very evil person. Um, you know, I've learned, I've learned a lot from where I've come from. It was a long road. Um, now I've got a new product. You know, just like I used to have a product in the street, my product's a positive message, but now um, I deal hope, not dope. And I, I, I tell people that drugs, jail, and crime's not worth it. And, um, you know, hopefully I can change people's lives to not go down the track I have, you know? And, um, yeah, yeah, yeah Gary, that's, 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 about that stage, yeah. while you're at that stage there, what words of advice would you say to a young one sort of up and coming in, in them sort of ways that you were? Well, if you yeah. had them in front of you, what would you sit down and say to them? 100%, you know, um, no one could tell me as a kid. No one could tell me when I was getting that mad money. You couldn't tell me. I had to learn the hard way. But um, you know how many people that I've lost along the way because they didn't get another shot like I did? I'm one of the lucky ones, and that's why I push a positive message. Um, you know, what's going to happen when you follow a life of crime is it's going to going to end up washed up on drugs. You're going to end up in jail for a very long time. You're going to end up dead. That's exactly how it ends. It ends no other way, you know. Um, when I found myself was when I was at rock bottom. How many people I know that have got to rock bottom and don't get a second chance? They end up in prison for the rest of their life. They end up dead. They commit suicide. They get stabbed and get shot and it's all over. They OD on drugs. They get that cooked on drugs. They lose their mind and they're never their self again. Do you know, um, that's how it ends. You know, I'm one of the lucky ones. You know, I really am. Um, I've got another chance. Thank fuck. You know, so I push a positive message and I would say to them that it's going to end bad. It's going to end bad. And, you know, it's a real roll of the dice when it does end bad that if you get another chance to walk the streets properly and live life to its fullest. You know what's gangster? I'd say to the kids, what's out? What's gangster? Sitting around the table with your mum, your dad, your brothers, your sisters, your son, your daughter, having a fucking Christmas dinner. That's gangster. You know, taking your dog for a walk. If you're a parent, you know, watching your kids grow, you know, um, I've had all the nice things. And you know what? If I plant a tree out the back and watch it grow, that's got more value than any fucking nice car I've had or any jewellery or any girl, you know? And that's the truth of it. I had to live and learn the hard way. Um, I learned from my lessons, you know? I turned my, my mistakes into lessons. Um, I hope that they're holding on to what I say and maybe I can plant a seed and, and maybe change their views and maybe make them you know, check what's going on a little bit. The high chance of it is, but they're going to have to learn themselves, you know? And um, it can go real bad. You go real bad, you know. Yeah. All right, so we, we'll start to wind it up there. But before we go, obviously, it's a great story there, and you're sort of helping guide sort of children and youngers in a, in another way. So, where can people follow you if they want to, you know, hear yep. your 
more of your stories and more of your stuff. Yeah, so TikTok Gary. Um, so TikTok Gary on all accounts. So Instagram, um, Facebook, um, TikTok. Obviously, TikTok is um, where I'm at. That's my bread and butter. Um, you know, I've created my own income. Um, social media, you know, I start, at the start of this year, I started documenting my road to redemption. Um, I put some war stories out there to grab some people's attention. Um, you know, I don't glorify the crime. You know, um, everybody's got a story. As soon as I grabbed their attention, then I started pushing a positive message. Um, you know, this I dropped merch. This is this is the merch here, Hope Cartel. You know, um, I'm a hope dealer. You know, I, I push hope on a decent level. Um, that's what I do on TikTok, on Facebook, on Instagram. Um, we, I do things like this. I um, interviews with people, but we do live interviews. Um, some some of the most notorious crooks around Australia I've interviewed. Um, you know, reformed criminals, but and um, we push a positive message. And we say if we can change our lives, then so can you. And it could be someone sitting on the couch eating Maccas, but they listen to our story and they think, fuck, man, I'm going to go to the gym. That might be it, you know, but we push hope, you know. And our main goal is a rehab centre. Um, we push rankings, you know, so rankings on TikTok. I don't know if anybody knows, but that's, um, um, you know, at the moment, I think last time we looked, it's run weekly. I looked today, I was 22nd. So the number 22 TikTok, I'm the 22nd TikToker, top TikToker in Australia and New Zealand that, wow. um, has been gifted. So, yeah, and those gifts, they come, they actually turn into real money. So, um, you know, it's an income. I, I drop merch. Um, I, I push rankings on TikTok, but also push a positive message, you know. Um, so, that, and that's my niche. That's what I do. So, I've created my own income, created my own brand. That's my new product, man, and I won't stop until I've got a rehab center, just like I wouldn't stop until I had nice things in the streets. Now I'm doing the righty with it, you know, put asses in beds, get them clean, and put them back out into the community. Yeah. Yeah, so it's good. Just great stuff you're doing now, Gary. So, Thank you. Yeah, tat off to you, mate. Take my off to you. Um, thanks, buddy. Thanks, thanks for coming on, Gary, and sharing your story. It's been absolutely wonderful to listen to. Uh, yep. Make sure you don't get bitten by any of them spiders or snakes, mate. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lee. I want to say thank you very much for the opportunity, my brother. Cheers, mate. Thanks for the opportunity. For coming up. Message to tell my story. Love your work, mate. Thanks, Cheers. Bye, bye, mate. Yeah, bye.